Welcome to this RSAA webinar. Patronage is a word with many connotations, including support, encouragement, privilege, and financial aid. Cultural history would be much poorer had it not been for the financial support given by the wealthy over many centuries to painters, sculptors, musicians, and others. Mozart once commented that he had not yet sunk so low as to work without a commission from a patron. Then there is political patronage. The US practice of giving ambassadorships to prominent donors to the president's party is a notable and of course entirely legal example. And then there is the area in which patronage becomes hard to distinguish from favoritism and corruption. And while this kind of political patronage is regularly a feature of authoritarian regimes, it can threaten them too. So we see China and Russia acting against individuals who have become a problem on at least public grounds of corruption. Of course, some of these corruption charges are themselves a cover for political ends, but they are effective propaganda because the problem is endemic and therefore to an extent believable. In 2011, in what became known as the Arab Spring, a common theme across the Middle East and North Africa was protest against patronage, clientelism, and the corruption that they generate in support of authoritarian rule. Matthew Hedges is an academic focusing on authoritarian regimes. His book, due out towards the end of this year, is titled Reinventing the Shaken, Clan, Power and Patronage in the UAE, and is based on his PhD from Durham. Matthew recently published an article in Asian Affairs on a related theme. And although it is not the subject of Matthew's talk today, it would be odd not to mention that he became well known three years ago, having been detained in the UAE in May 2018 and convicted of espionage in November of that year, but pardoned and released the same month. Matthew, we're glad to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much for, for having me, <clears throat> Michael, and, and for everybody else uh, attending here. Um, as Michael said, my, my talk today is going to be a, a summary and a, an overview of some of the themes that have uh, surfaced within my research and within the area with which my, my future, uh, my future re research endeavors will hopefully uh, move towards. I'm now going to share my screen as I will be giving a PowerPoint alongside this. So I'm here to discuss with you some of the observations about changing leadership dynamics across the GCC. Since 2001, every GCC state has witnessed some form of leadership change. However, since the Arab Spring, with the exception of Bahrain, this has again changed. All of these dynamics have been susceptible to internal and internal changes. But within recent years, there's been a visible change within the dynamics of the leadership networks. In Kuwait, of course, uh, a new emir was appointed in 2020. The Bahraini king has been the longest serving since 2002. Qatar had a new emir in 2013. A new Saudi king in 2015. Mohammed bin Zayed has been the de facto ruler of the UAE since Sheikh Khalifa's stroke in 2014. And of course, there was a new Sultan appointed in 2020. We will be looking at some of these dynamics and how they have looked to mimic some other dynamics seen elsewhere. Namely, within Russia, the Slaviki are is a term used to define the people of force, those within a shared history narrative around Russian President Vladimir Putin. He likes to take with him persons that have come from the security services. These have a direct relationship to him, either during his time at law school, during the KGB era in East Germany, St. Petersburg, um, and elsewhere, as well as during his tenure as the mayor in uh, Moscow. They have been selected for their strong work ethic. They have a particular outlook and perception of specific threats. 
the silver key are a indication that whilst there can be a, a variation of of requirements to hold power it ultimately comes down to these persons who are able to secure threats to secure and defend themselves against threats from internal sources while there were at times some form of internal destabilization within russia especially with the oligarchs um, moving into parts of power putin was able to use the security establishment to push numbers of these back and co-opt them into his rule. The, the system of power that Putin has is as close to the patriarchal form of politics within the, G, within the GCC as they could be within a rigid and formal political system. Likewise, many of these figures have hold multiple interlocking directorates, but that they all share that technocratic past with Vladimir Putin. This has seen them hold power both within public state institutions and private and private economically focused organizations. This further contributes to the idea that for a state to maintain its power, it must also be able to enforce its power. Patronage across the Gulf is one of the key dynamics in state society relations. It has become highly personalized across the region while still maintaining facets of modernization. This is a requirement that allows the rulers to not only increase competition, but also still enable the maintenance of strategic making power. This is to avoid the undermining of their own autonomy, but also increase their own power with the, um, with the veneer of actually reducing it. While previously changes could have been fairly difficult for a ruler because of different internal pressures, new power structures have been created to enhance those allies around the rulers. This has seen these new relationships and networks emerge, and often with personal relationships organizing around tribal, family, and work connections. Whilst some of them are easier to maintain than others, there has been a continued exploitation of Asabiya. With all of these, the locus of power has become increasingly important. Across the region, the family unit has over time expanded to be able to control the state. The most obvious example is Saudi Arabia, which has the state named after its own family. But on the one hand, whilst power is concentrated within this political unit, this also dramatically heightens the threat from those sources. This has meant that traditional and personal politics has often witnessed the direct direct management of these different sections. Over time, different family units and clans have emerged as powerful political actors with the rulers requiring the balancing of these different family branches. There are multiple examples of these family coalitions across the region, and many have em emerged directly as the sons and daughters of rulers. Within the UAE, Sheikh Zayed, he married his sons to other prominent tribes in order to balance the potential political threat that these could have. The most pressing is his eldest son, Sheikh Khalifa, who was married into his direct uncle's lineage. Likewise, in Saudi Arabia, the, the Steri clan is one of particular power that is able to balance those other interests from those across the wider uh, royal family. Over time, with the extension and maintenance of patronage, these units are able to secure fiefdoms within the state and prolong their control over these areas. When power changes, however, the depth of their control and impact can often be seen. And this is when, bringing back to the initial slide, the generational gap has become um, a particular focus for uh, analysis. Within the region, most particular, are the two new uh, crown princes in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Not only do they illustrate a generational gap, they are also distant from the original legitimacy of their ruling family who created the state. Less so in the case of Mohammed bin Zayed, but much more so in MBS. 
This has required them to change the parameters of legitimacy whilst also managing their own elite communities and support networks. With these two examples, it's been very clear about the requirement to, uh, to maintain the prolongation and management of succession. Appointing a crown prince allows the ruler to manage his potential threats and distribute this amongst those beneath him. This creates a barrier for the ruler, but also elevates the potential threat that his, that his um, successor may have. Hertz, among others, hypothesizes the crown prince problem. He suggests that by appointing a successor, a ruler can actually accelerate his own demise. In the modern day, however, these rulers and their successors face different challenges to that of before. They are modern and public facing institutions, as well as the fact that their behavior is somewhat accountable. And this has enforced a major direction change into the behavior of these actors. Furthermore, they have been impacted by external stimuli. The US and the UK have both illustrated a, a, an intention to switch focus to East Asia. The Arab Spring also showed that the Middle East and the Gulf may not hold that same focus that it once had, but entirely these actors have been forced to become much more deliberate and overt with their own leadership. And first of all, this requires these said actors to remove their threats. The clearest example of this is that of Mohammed bin, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. His rise showed that primogeniture, the, the policy previously followed within Saudi Arabia was to be avoided. Unlike other actors, he did not have a clear and pronounced clan or background of techn technocratic heritage. His position and emergence was a threat to the other branch of the family. Mohammed bin Nayef, the long-standing Minister of Interior, was older and much more widely respected. And likewise, uh, Mateh bin Abdullah would have followed uh, a succession pattern of primogeniture, but also had control of the Saudi National Guard. Furthermore, the wider cousins and, and family of the ruling family could have felt somewhat undermined and circumvented by the appointment of Mohammed bin Salman. So, learning the lessons that Putin had in Russia, MBS went after these, these threats and legitimized this behavior through a clampdown on corruption. This enabled him to restrict their ability as well as maintain the legitimacy of his actions as it was an easy win publicly and also helped keep these people in line. Other threats that Mohammed bin Salman uh, nullified were Prince Mansour bin Mukran, Prince Aziz bin Fahad, Walid bin Talal, Khalid al Tuwaydri, Turki bin Abdullah and Amir al Dubag. Not only did he look to stop the threats from the royal family, but also those from the elite networks. And this is simply one example, a very public example, that played out as a deterrent to reduce the potential threats to a new ruler. And in doing so, this largely reset the large portions of elite networks that there were present within Saudi Arabia. Another requirement for a ruler to take charge and to maintain those patronage networks is to install a new leadership and patronage circle. And the clearest way and one of the most overt examples is Oman. To do this, we can assess the values and attributes of these persons and help to analyze how and why these changes have been made. And following the death of Sultan Qaboos, Sultan Haitham took charge. He elevated his son, Said Thiazim, the, um, 
the third along as crown prince and gave him the ministerial portfolio of culture, sport and youth. This was not related to a security field, but one that allows him to oversee a majority of, of different issues while still remaining um, involved in, in those politics and decisions. In order to balance this acceleration, Sultan Haitham maintained the position of his brother, Saeed Shahab, to the role of Deputy Prime Minister for Defence and Security. This allows him to keep that family link and tie very close and maintain that power and, and technocratic uh, excellence. Likewise, he promoted the former Navy commander, Abdullah bin Hamis al raisi to the role of Chief of Staff. Again, he appointed Dr. Mohammed bin Nas Azabi as Secretary General with ministerial rank within the Ministry of Defense. He also kept General Sultan al naimi as Deputy Chairman of the National Security Council. What's clear from these appointments is that not only did Sultan Haitham acknowledge the need to secure those internal security related issues, but that they all had technocratic backgrounds. They were kin to him, they were closely linked, but they had the speciality in those roles and areas. Previously, this may have been appointed to those who were tribally close or they had other predominant factors, but Sultan Haytham showed that there was a clear requirement and necessity to keep those close actors around. I will, however, go on to focus in much more detail about the United Arab Emirates. In the UAE, leadership changes in 2004 and 2014 ushered in a new era of, of leadership. While Sheikh Khalifa's reign up until 2014 has been somewhat stable, the most overt changes have happened afterwards. Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince, effectively took charge and was acknowledged to do so in his state visit to India in 2016. And while he has been at the center and the foreground of this, clear changes to the regime have been shown in several areas uh, within his reign. At the center of this are his brothers, his four brothers, who are known as the Bani Fatima. Except for one of them, Sheikh Hamdan, the rest are in elite positions. Like in Russia and Oman, the UAE has a strong requirement and strong focus on security related elements. MBZ has utilized his long career within the armed force and the security apparatus to cultivate this network of allied persons. These have been both within the armed forces and also within the internal security apparatus. He was the third son of Sheikh Khalifa and behind his elder brothers, Khalifa and Sultan, uh, he was the third son of Sheikh Zayed and he was the third in line between his brothers, Khalifa and Sultan. By being slightly out of the picture and avoiding that crown prince problem, he'd been able to build that technocratic base for a long time. He kept those allies close throughout his career and oversaw a transition for those persons largely from the military into civilian positions. Uh, a clear example is the, the first chap in uniform next to Mohammed bin Zayed, which is the chief of staff, uh, Thaniel Ramethi. He was previously the head of intelligence in the armed forces and he was the chairman of Mohammed bin Zayed's office when he was chief of staff. In parallel to this, however, Mohammed bin Zayed has also developed a parallel economic base. Over time, he has created parallel institutions with the intention of either commandeering the state in its image or being ready and willing to incorporate these organizations under their arm. Again, this has accelerated since 2016. However, his brothers Mansour and Tahnoun have been the ones at the forefront of this. 
Whilst Mohammed bin Zayed has not even taken power yet formally, there are clear indications that he is preparing for a strong and long-term lineage. This is not only accelerating and, and raising the stature of Mohammed bin Zayed internally, but that he is keeping those persons very close to him. This is to, re this is to redraw the map of power and stability within the UAE, within the state, and within the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. These ties are often extremely personal and intimate. Clearly at the front of this are his sons, Khalid and Thiab. And in these two ways, he's able to maintain the power of the state, but he's also able to ensure that they are able to control these organizations for the long term. In essence, the UAE has created this system of security technocrats. They have the effective strategic management of the state and they all have direct relationships to Mohammed bin Zayed. At the top, top row, we have the foreign minister, Sheikh Abdullah, Sheikh Tahnoun, Mohammed bin Zayed, Sheikh Haza, and Sheikh Mansour. All four brothers to each other. Mansour holds a strong economic portfolio. Haza runs the internal dynamics for the Abu Dhabi, whilst Tahnoun holds a strategic portfolio that assists MBZ uh, with several portfolios. Um, close to this are his sons, Khaled and Thia. Between the seven of them, they're able to oversee and look at most issues that affect the entire state. We've seen, however, the development of this strategy and of this network over a long time. And this is where the bottom row of persons comes into power. We have Ali Al Shamsi, Deputy Secretary General of the National Security Council, and effectively a, a second in command or third in command to Tahnoun. Tahnoun is the National Security Advisor. The Deputy National Security Advisor is Khalid bin Mohammed bin Zayed, as well as the State Security Director. Between that column of personnel, they effectively run the internal security dynamics of the state. Under those persons is a former, um, is the uh, cybersecurity element, what was known as uh, NISA, now uh, referred to as the Signals Intelligence Agency. Uh, the first Director General was Jasma Zabi, whilst he was at Mubadala. He was also the manager of Khaled when they were both at Mubadala together. Jasma Zabi has now been um, promoted into a ministerial role and is on the Abu Dhabi Executive Council. Likewise, Khaldun Mubarak leads the UAE's and, and Mohammed bin Zayed's sovereign wealth fund Mubadala and oversees the strategic investment um, both internally and externally. Mubadala has become a, an unofficial accelerator of elites into, um, into government positions. And if you take a, a wider look at the, the government structure, a lot of them can be seen to have had that shared background and expertise in that institution close to Mohammed bin Zayed. In essence, it's become an accelerator and incubator for trusted persons. They all have direct links with each other and they all support the same network of power. And if anything can be learned from Russia and, and the rise of the Siddiqui is that these persons will continue to stay in prominent roles. Um, this succession pattern has been clearly defined and marked out. And that whilst there is a small military and an offensive aspect, there is a greater emphasis 
on intelligence and internal security. These persons have all, since 2016, grown into roles within the Abu Dhabi government and within the national government, but that this has also helped transition the state of the UAE from that of a federal image to that of a single state. Um, this is at, this is an analysis and observation of, of the top tier level, but one that can be expanded and looked at in, in multiple different ways. Um, that was a, that's a brief overview of, of some of those observations and dynamics that we've seen change uh, within the UAE, but that there is a, there's a sea change and difference within those persons. Um, I'd like to, you know, thank Michael and, and the RSAA for, for having me. I know it's a slightly brief overview, but um, we'll work some questions and discussions. Matthew, thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> that was very interesting. Um, uh, could I just uh, remind the audience, if you do have questions uh, for Matthew, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and um, please uh, use that uh, to post your questions, and um, we, we will do our best to, uh, to answer all of them. Um, I'll start off with a question from Laura Cretney. Uh, Matthew, how do you, she asks, how do you envisage relationships between the Gulf monarchies changing as this new younger generation of rulers becomes increasingly powerful? So as we've seen, they have become, they have maintained that informality. They have maintained a, a series of open and formal engagements but still maintain that, that, that discretion that allows them to, a, to have a, a degree of freedom in decision-making. Whilst they may, have a, um, they may have differences, they are much more able to engage them. Uh, with, with the elephant in the room of, of Qatar, they don't have the same um, burden and, and, and stubbornness with some issues. They also, unlike the, they may not be as trusted and patient as their forefathers. And this is something which obviously from, from the outside is um, an issue that, that's somewhat more um, uncomfortable for others. Thank you. I, I'm, I've got a couple of questions uh, here that um, probably overlap somewhat, so I'll, I'll uh, read them both out um, together. And from Dan Huntington, uh, Huntington, I beg your pardon, how do the smaller emirates fit into MBZ's plans? And from Robin Lamb, can MBZ ignore the northern sheikhdoms or has he sought to co-opt any? So the smaller emirates are a... They are somewhat of a, of, a, of a burden, but at the same time, they are a problem that he cannot ignore. They have, to a large extent, been co-opted, and this has been part of the, there are several united projects to, to bring the, the, the UA together. There's the Mohammed, Mohammed bin Zayed Road that traverses all of the Emirates. You have the, the greater economic projects try and, and rebuild that unity Whilst on the same hand, he has ensured that power has centralized heavily, not only within Abu Dhabi, but within his own power network. It, it's not so much that, that people are uh, wary that Abu Dhabi has had that power because that hasn't changed, but that it's very closely aligned to him directly. Um, were figures such as Sheikh Saif were to be promoted into other powers, this may appease others as it would not have that same Ben Fatima uh, link. Um, we can also look to examples um, such as the uh, small protests which occurred in Ras al following the, the death of, of um, following the death of around 50 UA soldiers in Maro from the war in Yemen. This, uh, this caused 
quite a significant concern and uprest within those communities in the north and, and led to some significant action um, by the state security. Um, Russell Kamer and Fajera in particular have faced um, some significant problems in, in managing and dealing their relationship with, with Abu Dhabi, but over time they have been, um, they've been brought into line uh, through this. Thank you. Um, Anthony Wynne asks um, a, a question that I guess you know, arises in, in all cases where these sorts of networks exist. Does the patronage you describe, he asks, compromise competence? Not inherently, but that those managers are, are trusted to oversee those projects more so than another actor. They are trusted to, to either fulfill the role or to be told what to do. Um, they may not be experts in those areas, but they will at least uh, act as the as the forebearer of, in, the, in this case, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed or with Sultan Tamim or or, or, other, um, or others. It, it often does, but it doesn't. It doesn't have to. Perhaps related to that, I mean, uh, Andrew Peacock asks, what, "What is the role of the military? Uh, thinking about an organisation that you do." prefer to be competent. Um, what is the role of the military? Is it just a way to widen support through patronage? So the, the military does work as a way to, to widen patronage, both on a targeted level, but also on a national level. So in terms of that identity building, and nation building, especially in the countries such as the UAE, the UAE armed forces can act as a way to, to unify their image and identity. And they've, they've done this in response to their, their engagements in Yemen, especially with the martyrs. They've found a way to, to plug into this and to, to try and show that the UAE armed forces are not split as they previously were, but they, they all fight for that same cause. Likewise, in Oman, that centralized and technocratic base that unifies the, that new leadership within Oman is one that cannot be uh, isolated. It's part and parcel of that Omani identity. What's difficult here is maybe how Mohammed bin Salman say, was able to ride the challenge of other internal actors to, to redirect and rewrite what the Saudi National Guard stood for, as, that's that, as that is there to protect, you know, that, that it's signal, a simple mission is there to protect the ruling family, but without its commander, does that then rewrite the parameters to that state society relationship? I'm going to shift um, focus slightly here. Victoria Hightower um, uh, has a question. She says, we know historically that women's role as brokers is a significant force in political dynamics. Where do you see the informal networks and women's role in the power brokering? Um, from the current presentation, they are simply pawns. And if women are simply the objects that you've suggested here, how then are men in the family used similarly? Um, how do brothers, fathers, uncles jockey to position their sons to enable them to achieve these experiences? For instance, uh, in the Mudadala pipeline. Yeah. Okay, so it's a, it's a great question because of course, it's not just about the, that, that male lineage, it's also about that, um, you know, the base of support by which their mothers uh, come from, that maternal, that maternal link. In essence, and, and I think just from evidence, women have not that same power in terms of, of cultivating those power networks, at least as it currently stands. They may bring values and attributes with them based on that tribal background in the same way that um, their male counterpart would, but there's nothing 
independence that they bring to the table that's dissimilar to men. When it comes to that technocratic excellence and development, so far there hasn't been any emergence within the political realm. Um, within the Mubadala pipeline, there isn't anything that, that distinguishes them maybe more so than a certain foreignness. There's a foreign education, there's a, there's a technocratic background that they all bring to the table. And as women are, have been more exposed in these communities to that, to that type of um, new experience, then we might see different changes in the future. But as it currently stands, there's nothing which um, is unique about, about those networks. Thank you. Um, Christopher Davidson asks, do you feel the apparently more militaristic and nationalist duty tinge to Emirati national identity these days might help reconstruct the old subsidy-based social contract? Hey Chris, so they will maybe go hand in hand because that national identity is still being worked through that, that predominant state down relationship. They're still being um, supported with uh, quite high salaries, with high pensions, but that those uh, military institutions and bases, for example, or the national service, they would have to uh, go and travel down to the Emirate of Abu Dhabi for the most part. There are a few other national service institutions in other Emirates or um, in other countries, do they have that same personal interaction and link? Are they able to, to rewrite it? Unless of course there was a more um, predominant and direct threat from say Iran, it would be more, it's still quite difficult to, to forge and maintain um, that constant threat and presence which can unite the armed forces. It would be easier for say Kuwait to do this than it would be for the UAE. Um, and I think we saw that the stress and pressure uh, from the from the war in Yemen. People were willing and open to support their engagement there, but once there were significant losses, people's patience uh, starts to go and they have they start questioning what they're actually doing there. Thanks. I'm going to sort of move to um to some more sort of uh, outward outward facing questions, uh, I, I guess. Um, uh, one one um, one listener asks: um, Is the maintenance of these power strategies um, only within the state border, or, or does it also engage with external networks and power? So, so absolutely, they are. Whilst these all are all somewhat domestically focused, there are extensions of these across borders. Um, they may work directly hand in hand with those security organizations, but also the economic ones for the purpose that they are both one and the other. A clear example would be looking at what the UA does in the Horn of Africa, its engagements in, in Somaliland right now, as well as in Tanzania. It's looking for those gas and oil explorations. It is trying to increase um, shipping routes and, and maintenance hubs, whilst also looking to, to counter security threats um, from violent extremists from Turkey and Qatar and others across the region. They would be using foreign personnel predominantly for those, but overseen by trusted uh, locals. And a couple of questions uh, relating to, uh, to Qatar here now. Um, could you just in general say a word about the rift with Qatar? But um, more specifically, um, MBZ was seen by many, uh, says, um, says one uh, viewer, as the leading force in the Qatar boycott, which now has less prominence, but may still rankle with MBZ. Um, he has also overtly backed away from the Yemen war, which was seemingly unpopular with many Abu Dhabi citizens. Uh, are these seen as mistakes? So... The perception towards Qatar is more emotional 
than that to their engagement in Yemen. Their engagement in Yemen is seen as a, as a rational purpose and requirement, but that a lessons learned um, assessment might say that they weren't ready, but that also the overall strategy um, was not correct. Um, they feel let down from the West for not assisting them more on the ground, especially in Hodeida. But that they also see the, the overt engagement of Iran in support of the Houthis was a clear reason for them to keep, uh, to keep involved in the conflict. Their perception towards Qatar has is, is, is been written about for a lot and it, it, it's not a short-term response. This is something of a wider institutional issue between the states. Um, this won't go away, things won't change. They may work, um, there may be you know, flights permitted between these states. The dolphin gas pipeline may continue, but that doesn't mean that trust is there. That doesn't mean that these countries will be willing to work together on, on, on a wider scale uh, of issues. Was Yemen a mistake? No, they, they've still, they are still extending their power into the Horn of Africa, into the, into the, uh, the Bab al-Mandab. It was maybe a, a, a recalculation of what the estimated cost would be. Um, and they, they've clearly changed their footprint, footprint on the ground to, to, to show this. Just sort of turning to Oman <clears throat> now, Richard Booth, um, uh, asks, how do you think Haitham and his son will approach security and intelligence issues? Will they trust others to lead the apparatus or try to consolidate control? <clears throat> and he comments that sort of Caboose succeeded by fragmenting power and influence among key agencies. Can Haitham afford to do the same, given internal and external threats? Um, thanks, Rich, for the, for the question. So like with the, as I tried to show earlier, thanks with the, um, thanks with the, with, with the comparison to, to Russia and others, is the, is the requirement to consolidate power before they can expand it again through their trusted networks. So Sultan Haitham elevated those trusted persons both to him, but also to the Omani state. There are checks and balances along the way, both within his family, but also amongst the, um, those elite ranking members. And whilst they will have that technocratic focus, that also allows them to be less somewhat political. In this sense, those actors haven't had that same exposure to political engagement because for the majority of their lives, Sultan Qaboos has, has, has been the ruler. They haven't known anything else. Um, and now the idea of succession has been somewhat quashed. There was little um, turbulence from it. It's unlikely that there would be any immediate change, but there will have to be consolidation before there's the, uh, the renegotiation of those elite networks. And this is something that will happen over time when they've become uh, more popular when they've become uh, more comfortable in their roles. And, and this um, is staying with the same sorts of threads that uh, we, we've been following for a few minutes. Can you define the effect of political cooperation within the GCC towards less wealthy neighbouring countries and those with energetic commercial and political and religious demands? At the moment, that political cooperation has, has been shown to be nearly uh, single directional. It, it's, it's been a form of co-option. In Egypt, it was the investment in those, some economic areas, but largely security as that extended barrier into North Africa. In Sudan, it's been the pushback against um, political Islam. In India, it is the economic rights and in, maybe in a similar way to what China, uh, China's strategy is, it's the, it's the apolitical um, strategic investment, but with those Gulf states holding the reins. Um, you've seen a, a slow change in, 
in adoption of uh, quietest traditions across parts of Africa, and this follows um, the UAE's promotion in those areas. They've learned lessons from their engagements in, in Libya, in Somalia, in, in, in Yemen, and others. But at the moment, they are also responding to the growth of Turkey in the same, in that same area. Thank you. Um, a, a question that two people have, have asked, um, uh, namely, is there a career path? Um, is it possible for people to break into official circles from, for example, the great commercial families? Uh, well, absolutely there is, and there are examples of this occurring. This has been, th there are examples of this occurring. They are, uh, as, I, as I previously mentioned, they have actually tended also to be uh, Western educated. Um, there are different generations where you see this occurring. Um, there are several ministers at the moment who come from commercial families and even from uh, quite small tribes in the north. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the picture of the UA in Mubadala, it was that technocratic growth and proximity to those rising figures that enabled it. Um, in, in Saudi, is this closer to some of the other economic institutions? This is more likely to happen in those areas than it would be in, say, security. In security, those traditional dynamics will continue uh, to keep their course. They're, they're, they are somewhat um, split between the two, between the maintenance of power and the enforcement of power. Thank you. Um, the, um, an, an, another element of society um, being brought in here by Anthony Wynn, um, in the picture of patronage that, uh, that you've described, could you say a bit about how the ulema fit in? Hmm. Largely across the region, the ulema are, they, they, they follow the, the, the state directed orders, much more so in, in some countries than others. And this is, this is certainly accelerated to a centralized form of, of, of tradition. Um, again, the Saudi Arabia has, has seemed to, to follow the UA in this example where the al kaf the religious ministry produced the, the Friday sermons and they essentially uh, publicize those and, and produce them. Over time, this is, this is uh, accelerated for that quiet tradition to make more sense politically. And this is something which you see them proactively uh, engaging with and pushing uh, within South Yemen, uh, with the STC, there is a continuation of that quieter tradition so that it, it enables uh, that political action and leadership. It suits their pursuits uh, quite well. I can't, um, I can't comment on, on some of the other countries in the Gulf because I, I simply don't know them um, as well. Could you, I mean, in terms of um, relations between within the UAE. Could you say something, ask Keith Nuttall, about the relationship be between MBR and MBZ uh, and the role of Dubai? So since the financial crash in what 2008-2009, uh, Dubai has increasingly become, um, increasingly become tied to, to Abu Dhabi more so than it had ever been. Um, during this time, relations between MBZ and MBR have, have they significantly deteriorated. Um, back in 2018, they, they were pretty uh, they were pretty poor between the two figures, um, and the Emirate of Dubai has required more funding um, from from the capital. Dubai will continue to be the attracting the attractive element for the rest of the country uh, to benefit from, but that it has increasingly come under the direct control of, of Abu Dhabi. Furthermore to this, the reputational cost that, that MBR has brought to the country has further, um, has further reduced his own um, political capital. And he's been seen more and more as a, as a potential danger to, this, to the stability of the state. And whilst MBR has been at the forefront of the development of Dubai, his potential successors are not as strong and they don't hold the same legitimacy as he has. 
as a result, the, the future shows and the future seems to illustrate that any independence that Dubai may have had in the past, it won't happen anywhere near the same degree in the future. Um, on on um, the question again of um, access to the sorts of power networks that you're talking about, have any foreigners managed to break into these family power networks um, and, and had any meaningful influence on decisions, so far as you know? So there are um, there are several examples. Um, where they do stand out, these have, they are often situated at quite strategic positions as well. Um, so the Mubadala Board of Directors were for a while, there, there were quite, there were several, um, there were several foreigners there helping uh, the development of the institution, but they have slowly been replaced and that's been part of that nationalistic uh, drive to, to take power. Close to MBZ, there are the, there have been figures uh, within the strategic messaging of the state and of the country. There are those within the security elements which help drive it, and then those which also act as um, strategic envoys for the state and the policy. Um, they're less about creation as they are about the inaction of that policy um, because ultimately that that will come down to those uh, native persons but they act as those magnifiers um, to help them uh, enact those decisions absolutely um and um turning briefly to you know the um the source of uh uh, well, the modern source, at any rate, of uh, of, of the power. Um, in the longer term, how is the, uh, the the eventual decline in the demand for oil and gas foreseen, and and how what sort of impact is that going to have on the producers' incomes, and by extension, presumably also their ability to um, to, to manage the sorts of networks that they rely on. And so I think this definitely comes back into also what, what Chris was, uh, he asked me about earlier with regards to the, the reinterpretation of those elite networks and those patronage uh, sides. How will they be able to reinterpret that, that relationship? And we hear and we often see uh, different arguments as to what will happen. There is, a, an, there is an assumption that they will be able to continue extracting rent and sources from oil and gas, um, at least in, 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 in Qatar and in, in the UAE and Saudi Arabia for, for the next generation of leaders. But for those currently in power, it's the idea that it doesn't, it won't impact them directly. Uh, it's quite a short-sighted view. And in contrast to many of the strategies that they profess to develop, uh, you know, the Abu Dhabi vision, uh, the strategic visions that they often publish and repeat, but that these are, these are presented to, to foreign audiences to justify, you know, further investment. That's not to help rewrite and reinterpret those elite patronage networks. Were those elite patronage networks to change, that would severely undermine the political structure by which they, they currently stand under, and as a result, there would be a seismic change within these societies. As a result, it's something that they would look to be able to, to manage gradually over time rather than a sea change overnight. Um, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be a, a significant um, policy to change this. One final question. A, a, um, a member of the audience notes that you know, the UAE and, and other states in the region Saudi Arabia, for example, talk about having more visitors um, in the coming years, um, more residents, but um, th there is an issue relating to <clears throat> the judiciary um, and, uh, uh, and justice. Um, 
and uh, the uh, the questioner mentions particularly the the case of uh, of the princess um, princess Haya that has reemerged in the news very recently. What is the outlook for the region in this area? Do you think um, it is uh, is it going to change? Uh, are other countries uh, using their influence sufficiently? So I think, as, as we heard, um, we've heard from several states uh, very recently, even as, as even as closely as yesterday, that there are differing interpretations and, and policies and strategies to direct their foreign policy. But on the other hand, there has been a uh, like a, a slow disregard or a, a slow change away from that values-based approach. The idea of a, of a politics Politics first approach has, has, has slowed down. Values aren't as much of a driver as they used to be in those regional engagements. And we can always look and compare examples of, of abuses um, in the international media. So we had a member of the Abu Dhabi ruling family uh, torturing an Afghan um, national over overcharged rice. This was shown on CNN and the international outcry was, was significant versus that of the, um, versus that of what, what happened to Jamal Khashoggi and, and the lack of um, response or formal attribution to those acts. Um, I think that, that that's quite a predominant illustration of, of the lack of interest in upholding those values and, and holding these states to account, that's not in the state's interest to do this. And I don't think that will change. We do have to stop there, but I would like to thank Matthew for an absorbing talk and for illuminating some of the darker corners of, of Middle East politics. And thank you also to all of you who have joined us today. Our next webinar will be on the 1st of April, which is a Thursday. James Croden, who will be speaking then, gave the last talk to the society in central London before the pandemic drove us off the streets. I hope to see you all then, but for now, goodbye.